Hey, see you now, listeners. It's Shauna Butler welcoming you to 2021 and the second year of our podcast. It's an honor, a privilege, and just plain exciting to celebrate incredible innovations and innovators and share such remarkable stories. Visiting the frontiers of Alaska during a global pandemic, checking in with innovators, providing health screenings for the homeless, some of our most vulnerable citizens during this time, meeting nurses on the front lines of a protest, investigating the complexities and developments in the world of organ recovery and transplant, bringing awareness to what one nurse is doing to make sure fathers and fatherhood are nurtured and supported has been awe-inspiring and humbling. We also heard from nurses who are using gaming, incorporating AI and legislating to help deliver more effective, safer, and better care. And finally, as we review, it is striking to listen to and to continue to learn how nurses were innovating during past epidemics, such as HIV and AIDS and Ebola. And of course, there are so many stories of courage, of brilliance and insights and innovation still to come. And it's because of you, our listeners, who continue to listen, to subscribe and to share and to champion See You Now, that we're able to continue on into another year. So thank you. And we are so looking forward to the year ahead. In launching See You Now, in our very first episode, we posed some rather weighty existential questions. Why this podcast and why now? And we did so with high ideals, grand ambitions, and a clarity of purpose. And that, unbeknownst and completely unanticipated, was just a few weeks before nurses and health innovators across the world would be called upon to respond to a generational global health and economic crisis that would drastically, dramatically, and rapidly change how we live, work, play, and pray. When asked, why this podcast and why now? We answered, because nurses will save this planet and civilization one person, one family, one community at a time. Well, 2020 and the global coronavirus pandemic demonstrated we were not exaggerating. And now, more than ever, it rings true. As we launch into our second year of storytelling, we wanted to return to our first episode to ground why we continue to focus on nurse-led innovation and to listen with new ears that are tuned to where we are now in 2021. So much of what we talk about in this particular show remains prescient and vital. Now more than ever, the See You Now stories of health innovation and nurses leading them are critical to improving health and saving lives. There's no shortage of problems. Social isolation and loneliness and the risk of being alone. Violence and disease and infection and human suffering. Rising health care costs, uninsured individuals. If we don't do something different, we're going to be in some serious trouble. You have to engage the nurse because they understand these problems because they're the ones living it day in and day out. We're four million strong just in this country. Nurses are at the heart of health care. They're at the forefront. Nurses touch every aspect of a patient's life. Nurses are kind of like the MacGyvers of the healthcare field. There's nobody better than nurses to, to figure this out. So if nurses are this huge fountain of resources and insights coming up with all sorts of clever ideas and designs and solutions, why are we not seeing them in the headlines? I'm Shauna Butler, and this is See You Now. In this introductory episode of See You Now, we're going to do a few things. We'll answer the question, why this podcast? We'll explore Johnson & Johnson's long history supporting nurses and nursing across the globe. And we'll ask, why now? What makes 2020 the year to launch a podcast about nurse-led innovation? Oh, and a little bit about me. As a nurse economist, 
my focus is raising awareness around where nurses are creating clinical and economic value. And as a health tech enthusiast, I'm excited about how and where nurses are driving innovation and transformation across the entire health ecosystem. Welcome to Episode Zero, kind of like our patient zero of the podcast. Stay with us. See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. So let's start with why this podcast? With so many podcasts out there, why do we need a podcast about nursing? Easy answer. Because nurses will save this planet and civilization one person, one family, one community at a time. But the real question is, why don't we already know that? While health researchers are sought after to advise tech and device companies, nurses are not. While doctors are invited to guide and advise government officials about treating epidemics like Ebola, nurses are not. While insurance companies are featured in news stories about vaccination rates, nurses, those who actually administer the vaccines, are not. Nurses and what they do are invisible. So why are nurses invisible? And why is it a problem? And what can we do about it? Diana Mason is the Senior Policy Professor for the Center for Health Policy and Media Engagement at George Washington University School of Nursing. She, along with Barbara Glickstein, public health nurse, health reporter, and communication strategist, co-authored The Woodhull Study Revisited, Nurses' Representation in Health News Media 20 Years Later. Their research was a follow-up to the 1997 landmark paper, The Woodhull Study on Nursing in the Media, Healthcare's Invisible Partner, which painted a dismal picture of nurses and nursing in the media. You can find links to both studies along with more information in our show notes or on our website, seeyounowpodcast.com. We spoke to them about why nurses remain invisible in the media and what needs to be done to change that. My name is Diana Mason. I do use J, Diana J. Mason, in print just to differentiate me from another Diana Mason who does healthcare work. Hi, this is Barbara Glickstein. I'm a public health nurse and a health reporter. I'm a media strategist. I like working in all forms of media. I am excited to be chatting with you. Can you talk a little bit more about Woodhull, the name of the study? Where does that story originate? Nancy Woodhull is a founding editor of USA Today, and she was hospitalized uh, with a cancer diagnosis. And I think not dissimilar to many people's experiences, either their own personal experience or then subsequently a family member, they recognize the critical role that nurses play in their care. And as a founding editor of USA Today and recognizing that nurses were not used in her experience as expert sources, she wanted to find out if that was true based on her hunch. So she she contacted a colleague through uh, the University of Rochester School of Nursing, who then connected with Sigma Theta Tau, the Professional uh, Scholars Nursing Association. And actually, the graduate students at Rochester School of Nursing did this study. They looked at one month's view of resources in print, as well as some of the um, hospital-based professional publications to see whether or not nurses were used as sources. Uh, And what they discovered was that they were only used in 4% of quotes or other sourcing in health news stories in leading print national and regional newspapers, 1% in weeklies in those industry publications, such as modern healthcare. They were never cited in health policy, health economics, health clinical systems, or clinical expertise. And so 20 years later, our research team decided it was time to see whether any of that has changed. And I'm sorry to be a spoiler, but it has not changed. So 
someone who has been looking at this issue and interviewing nurses and on our own radio program, interviewing nurses for our blog, I had a lens thinking that things had changed. I saw certain small things change, like images on the front page of the New York Times above the fold, where in the past only the white male physician was identified and those standing with him were not. And now occasionally you'll see that it's a nurse that's identified in the ER or OR. However, our study, we have basically the same data. Nurses are still invisible in health news stories. We looked at the current um, print publications that still exist. We did a qualitative study where we interviewed health reporters and wanted to know if they used nurses as sources and if they didn't, why not? And if they did, how did it change their reporting? Diana. Yeah, so journalists, they told us if they interview a nurse as a source, that they have to justify that with their editor. And they repeatedly said that they're expected to go after the rock star physician, the rock star doc. And that's what is valued in health journalism too often. So there is this bias about physicians, and it plays out in the Woodhall study. We had journalists tell us that even when they called a academic medical center and asked for a nurse as a source, they were directed to a physician. <laughs> we also heard that from them in terms of calling universities, that they were directed to the School of Medicine and not the School of Nursing. And in our own um, experience, we recognize that there are things that nurses need to do to change this course, not only educate journalists and newsrooms um, about their biases, but also about why we are experts and how we change the story or we add to the story by the frame that we bring to it. So for example, there has been a tremendous increase in unvaccinated children in certain very religious Orthodox communities here in New York City and Brooklyn and in Rockland County. What the team of Orthodox nurses from the Orthodox Jewish Nurses Association did was they joined together and because of their because they know the culture, they understand what was happening. They investigated and discovered that some leaders in that community were presenting propaganda to a population um, without any evidence in science. And this group of nurses, and I want to highlight Blimey Marcus, she went in and started educating the community. And I believe because they both understood the science and they're very science-based in answering and rebutting the propaganda, as well as sensitive to the culture, that a lot of the reporting started to shift from blaming the community to having a better understanding that there was a deeper story here. Uh, and her story and the story of this group of nurses got out. The New Yorker covered it. The New York Times covered it. There was lots of, lots of coverage of it. And I think it's a really recent and wonderful example of nurses not avoiding speaking to the media and helping understand why this might be a problem and how best to approach it. So when you first went into doing the Woodhull Revisited, there's quite a bit of reason to believe that nurses would be quoted more regularly or used as sources as subject matter experts, increasing rates of um, doctorate degrees, nurses advancing at all levels of leadership, um, higher levels of bachelor's prepared nurses working in healthcare environments, nurses working in industry. There's many data points to think that there would actually be a difference. So, I mean, were those some of the things that your research team was thinking about when you were conducting the study? Well, that's what we had hoped we would see in the results, but that's not what we saw. And so despite all we, of those advances, despite all those advances. And, and I have to say there wasn't one nurse that was sourced in stories about health policy. And the month that we were combing data was August of 2017, when all of these conversations were going on about the Affordable Care Act. So the idea that there would be so little information available 
of nurses as sources during that time was quite striking. Yeah. What nurses were mainly quoted about were the nursing profession, scope of practice and mm -hmm. removing archaic obstacles to um, nurse practitioners to be able to practice to the full extent of their education and training, um, as well as questions of whether there is a nursing shortage. Those were the kinds of articles that were found mainly. One of the questions, and I'm curious what your your thought is, it feels like it's the elephant in the room. We can't really separate out the issue of gender in this. Exactly. Um, so, so what are you finding and how does gender play a role in nurses not being featured or included or thought of as subject matter experts? Well, first of all, women are, are continue to be under underrepresented in media in health in news media. Women now make up fifty percent, more than fifty percent of journalism students, hmm. but they are only represented. Uh, thirty three percent of newsrooms are are women, and there are even fewer who are at the at level of editor and publisher. Now that picture has been changing. And the Women's Media Center monitors this on a, on a regular basis. So that is improving. But the data that we collected in our health news stories on who, who were the sources in the stories that we looked at showed that indeed women were still underrepresented in those health news stories. But they're being underrepresented in the newsroom. So until you start raising awareness of, of the, this underrepresentation and the fact that good journalism is about diverse sources, diverse ideas, uh, diverse stories. So diversity is key to excellence in journalism. And the more that we can raise that issue and talk about what nurses bring to a story, and not a story about nursing, it, we've <laughs> got to position ourselves to speak to the healthcare issues, health policy issues of our day. And we have to be proactive in doing that. So how are you both proactive in interacting with the media? I mean, when it comes to raising the visibility of nurses and stories, like, so what do we do? I mean, Barbara, what are you doing? I look at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and I catch up on not only health news, but what's going on in the world that will impact health news and health policy. And then I go on Twitter um, and often, as we know, there are breaking news on Twitter that haven't made it to print or digital. And I'm following a lot of nurses as well as other people in the health space um, that are educating me on many issues. And I follow a lot of health reporters um, to stay on top of what they're covering as ways of having a better understanding of maybe are they using nurses as sources? Can I reach out to them after I read their piece? And I will write to a journalist or direct message them or retweet their story and ask, did you try and reach a nurse expert? Please know that I'm available to help you find them. Why do you think nurses aren't raising their voices? If you raise your voice in a hospital when you're employed in a hospital, you may lose your job. And that's a reality. When I was editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Nursing, I would get letters from nurses all the time in response to editorials that I wrote challenging nurses to speak up. And time and time again, nurses would write about how they spoke up, how they blew a whistle, how they, they challenged what was going on, and they lost a job. And then they were blackballed in their community and couldn't get another job. So there is a lot of, of fear around job security, and I think that's one reason why. I think also with nursing education, I think we have to encourage students to speak up, to take risks, calculated risks, to challenge things in thoughtful ways. And I'm not sure we're always doing that. What are the problems that are arising when we don't have diversity represented in our reporting and in our sources? What happens when you don't have that? What, what I think most journalists don't realize is that nurses do bring a voice that's different from the, the perspectives of physicians. There's a lot of overlap, but there's a big difference too. We are with patients 24 seven. We understand patients within the context of a family and a community. We understand self-care management. Our focus is not just 
treating a disease. It's helping this person to manage their care, to prevent health problems, to speed up their recovery, and to sort of uh, integrate the meaning of this experience of health and illness in their lives. Hospice care was brought to this country by a nurse, Florence Wald. If you look at most palliative care and hospice programs these days, they will be headed by physicians. Quality departments, nurses were leaders in quality processes. Health systems are now putting physicians as head of the quality work. Integrative health care, it was nurses who were in the forefront of integrative health care and, and complementary care. Now most of the health systems that have these programs have them headed by physicians. Despite the fact that we've got so many examples of nurse managed health centers that are doing phenomenal work and are headed by nurses. And Shauna, I'll tell you, back in the 1990s, I did several studies with a colleague, Sally Cohen, on nurse practitioners' arrangements with managed care organizations. And in one qualitative study that we did, we found that the nurses said they didn't want to share in risk and they didn't want to share in the reward aspect that managed care organizations were arranging. They wanted to remain invisible. Interesting. And that's no longer, yeah, that's no longer <laughs> acceptable. We cannot be invisible. We have to be visible. And I would argue the other piece of this media component is that we have to share our perspectives with the public. I believe we have a social responsibility to help to educate the public and share perspectives on health, on illness, and experiences in healthcare. I, so I, this I, is yeah, not just I, being visible, it's serving the public. I think that there's actually a bigger story here. And that is, how long has it been since our future generations have a lower life expectancy than our current generation? When mm -hmm. have we seen a decline in sure. the health and well-being of women who are pregnant and the babies that they're carrying? When have we seen immunization rates as low as they are? When have we seen people experiencing death in ways that they do not want, that are not dignified? To your point, there's a responsibility here. And part of this is helping policymakers and our other healthcare colleagues to understand what our training is, what our preparation is. When the work is invisible, how is it that you can leverage it? It's not even acknowledging or compensating. It's more how do you leverage that? And when we take a look at these very disturbing trends, how are we going to turn that around? How do we actually deliver on that responsibility that we have to the public? So I think it goes beyond just being visible. I think it, it really requires that we value our voices and our perspectives. So this embraces that context of women's work mm. and historically what has been thought of women's work and women's voices being not valued. So the whole idea of compassion and caring and the fact that nurses have long held on to that even when society didn't value it. But if we had a society that was not so biased about women's work and women's values and perspectives, these systems would have been better a long time ago. So we've got a lot of work to do. And with 2020 being the year of the nurse and, and the midwife, it's a great opportunity around the world to highlight the great work that nurses do, because you're right, the public is not aware, nor our healthcare providers, nor our healthcare administrators really aware of what nurses contribute. So we really have to do a better job of educating the public and educating journalists about what nurses do. Because while we replicated the original Woodhull study, we wanted to find out why do we have this picture? So we interviewed health journalists to ask them, what have been your experiences with interviewing nurses? And what are some of the barriers and facilitators? And they told us, you know, uh, we don't really understand what nurses do. We know that they're at the bedside in hospitals, but beyond that, we are not clear about the many roles they play and what they do. Uh, my colleague Barbara Glixie and I both know that very often our, our health journalism colleagues, we're both members of the Association for Healthcare Journalists, and our colleagues will tell us when they call nurses for an interview, they don't get a quick response, if any. They always get a response from physicians. Physicians will drop everything to be able to talk to a health journalist. And so we've got to get savvier about 
how to uh, how to be responsive to calls for interviews, how to prepare for them, how to deal with the anxiety we may feel about them, what clearances we need, that kind of thing. But we've we've got to start developing media competencies and using those competencies. One way to do that is for chief nurse officers to step up and have conversations with the CEOs of the hospitals who often make the decisions about what the priorities for PR will be and say that, uh, you know, we've got some deep expertise here and nurses are trusted by the public more than anybody. Let's let's put our our best nurses out there and, and work with the media uh, to get important stories out. And then to work with the PR department to uh, shape stories, to prepare their nurses, et cetera. So I think we all have a responsibility in all of this. And certainly I know I'm trying to do my best to challenge nurses to step up. And I, I'll tell you, the younger generation is all over it. I was going to ask you what makes you optimistic, but I think you just answered that. And I, I share that when yeah. I, first of all, when I go into the nursing schools right now and meet some of the nursing students, I am in awe and humbled and yeah. also quite aware if I were applying, I don't think I could get in. Um, I'm just... <laughs> or get through. <laughs> I, I am just um, just so yeah. impressed. And when I see yeah. the training that you're doing and helping to eat, help each one of us to share our message in a more confident way, in a way that's more understandable and approachable, that's what makes me optimistic. What about you? What What are you optimistic about? Well, I think I think the rise in second degree students, those students mm. who have a degree in another field and have come back in to become nurses, they're it's a it's a different breed. They are ready to be out there. They are very challenging students, which is great. And so I, I, I actually I actually do believe that some of us that are older need to get out of the way and open doors for them. Uh, we need to not hug up all the positions. <laughs> we need to uh, pass the opportunities along and then support uh, the younger generation when they go into those positions. Diana Mason is the Senior Policy Professor of the Center for Health Policy and Media Engagement at George Washington University School of Nursing. Barbara Glickstein is a public health nurse, health reporter, and communication strategist. Together, they co-authored The Woodhull Study Revisited, Nurses' Representation in Health News Media 20 Years Later. So it's not our imagination. Nurses are not being featured in substantive conversations. And that's a problem, a serious problem. When the public isn't aware of what nurses do and the value they add, they're missing out. They're missing out on essential, life-improving, even life-saving information. And so are the policymakers and industry leaders. That's why a podcast about nurse-led innovation needs to be on your playlist. But why would a global company want to collaborate with the American Nurses Association to create a podcast about nurse-led innovation? For Johnson & Johnson... The commitment to nursing goes way back. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our museum. Um, we're going to start the tour down here, so I'm going to just start with a little housekeeping. Um, feel free if you Margaret Gurowitz is the chief historian at Johnson & Johnson. We caught up with her in New Brunswick, New Jersey, where she was leading a tour of the J&J Museum. When you walk into any Johnson & Johnson building anywhere in the world, the first thing you see is our credo. And what our credo basically says is, we put responsibility to others before responsibility to ourselves. Um, and if you notice the first paragraph, we believe our first responsibility is to the patients, doctors, and nurses. Um, today, we have many, many employees um, around our enterprise who are nurses, so many that we have an employee resource group for employees who are nurses. The first nurse employees we have a record of uh, are from the 1890s. They ran the quality control for our sterile surgical products manufacturing, a very important role. We're going to go upstairs to do the rest of the tour. Um, and if anyone has any questions at any time, please don't hesitate to ask. We very much know that as a healthcare company, we can't do what we do without people on the front lines. Nurses have been incredibly important to Johnson & Johnson from the very beginning. 
Linda Benton is a senior director at Johnson & Johnson and leads their nursing campaign. For us, it's been a lifelong calling of this organization. You know, the nurses are, as, as we always say, they're in the first line of the credo, um, is one of our key stakeholders that we really value. And we are at a really important time in healthcare because the U.S. healthcare system, it is complex. And we really feel that there is an army of nurses out there, four million to be exact, that have the, the training, the knowledge, the skills, the resourcefulness, and the interest in doing more to really contribute to the healthcare system and strengthen it. I think the challenge now is to getting this message and this, this content out to a broader audience who's interested in innovation and healthcare as a whole. Because what I found is when talking to people is people aren't, nece- aren't necessarily of the mindset of, well, I'm not going to talk to a nurse because they're not important. It's, it's, it's always more of, oh, I never thought about that. I should be talking to a nurse. How did I miss that? I'm going to start talking to nurses as I'm developing products and bringing things forward. So it's not, it's not something that's intentional. It's really just something that, for some reason, they've missed along the way. So I think the more that we can expose a broader audience to the, the impact and the contributions of nurses, I think the more things are going to open up and people are, it's not going to be just a nurse-on-nurse conversation. It's going to be a conversation that's with a broader healthcare audience. And that's one of the things that J&J is working to do is to broaden that audience and help people to see nurses for the true value they bring to healthcare. For the American Nurses Association, the reason for creating a podcast about nurse-led innovation is about a commitment to nurses as well, and then some. Nurses are natural-born leaders, uh, and uh, and society looks to, you know looks towards that. And maybe once they see that nurses are speaking up, you know, then uh, other members of the community will be joining right in as well. Ernest Grant serves as the 36th president of the American Nurses Association. Throughout his career. He's logged a lot of firsts, including being the first African-American male elected president of the ANA. Just by being who he is, he is changing the way people imagine who nurses are and what they can be. When he first entered nursing in the 1970s, men made up only 5% of the nursing workforce. Now, 9% are men. Only a handful of nurses were African-American or other ethnicities. Now, it's 19%. Ernest Grant, if I were going to produce a film and I were doing a casting call and I needed to cast a nurse, more than likely what I'd be looking for is a young white female dressed in scrubs with a stethoscope around her neck at the bedside of a patient demonstrating just how much she cares about that person. You would not be the person that they would typically cast (laughs) as a role of a nurse. This is true. What language and what images are necessary to broaden the understanding of what nurses do, have done, can be, and should be doing? Well, I'm I'm so glad you brought up that descriptor because one of the uh, goals that I ran on for this office was to increase the diversity representation of nurses. I think nurses and nursing should reflect the individuals that we care for. So one of my goals during this term is to highlight our differences, but um, you know, also let people know that we're not all that, you know, that individual that you describe, but uh, we, are, we run across the whole rainbow of colors, if you will, as well as gender. So I think as uh, we begin to interact more with the media and the role of the nurse is being showed in different ways than the stereotypical person like what you had just uh, just described, the public will begin to, uh, you know, to recognize that, hey, um, they are part of the community, you know, and just because they're wearing scrubs, that means they may work in an acute care setting, but they also are uh, perhaps in the, you know, the local school. You will also find nurses who are working in the aerospace industry. So we have our footprint in several different areas uh, in addition to the acute care setting in the 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 hospital or within the community. And of course, you'll also find nurses in the the legislative uh, state houses as well as in the the U.S. Congress. Uh, There are four nurses who are elected representatives that are serving in the U.S. Congress. And in my home state of North Carolina, we have three registered nurses that are also members of the North Carolina House. If you ask the average Joe out there, they would be surprised to find that out. And so one of my goals is to 
put more light on, on uh, you know, who we are and what we do and all the different areas in which nurses may be as opposed to just only being defined as being in the acute care setting. Ernest Grant serves as the 36th president of the American Nurses Association. I'm Shauna Butler, and this is See You Now, Episode Zero. So this podcast, why now? Why is 2020 the year to launch a podcast about nurses and midwives? I want you to meet my friend Barbara Stilwell. She's the executive director of the Nursing Now Global Campaign. She worked with the World Health Organization in health systems development. She was one of the first nurse practitioners in the UK. She was educated there and in the United States. She's practiced in the underserved areas of Africa and Australasia and the Caribbean, and she's advised at the government level on healthcare issues, including immunization and migration. I'm Barbara Stilwell. I'm the executive director of the Nursing Now Global Campaign. And I came to this job from a job in international development, which I'd been in for 12 years, where I had really seen the need for uh, a better, more focused health workforce that was going to be able to help us achieve universal health coverage. Um, And before that, I worked with the World Health Organization on health workforce, um, which again led me to see that the world is so short of health workers that we're very unlikely to achieve the sustainable development goals unless we do something about that. Hence my enthusiasm for nursing. You mentioned the sustainable development goals. So how is nursing tied to the sustainable development goals? So the sustainable development goals are, are very broad and ambitious And they address not only health in its sort of purest form, but also women's health, economic development, climate. And all of these areas are areas that nursing is involved in. We know that if you develop nursing, it has a triple impact. It develops not only people's good health, but it also has an impact on the number of women coming into the workforce. So it helps support gender equality when women don't have opportunities and chances to work. And it also uh, supports economic development in two ways. One is through supporting women to contribute to the workforce. But secondly, and very importantly, if you don't have a healthy population, uh, you're not going to have people in work paying taxes So improving health improves the economic outlook of any population. And so nursing has a key triple impact in that way, but it also does on other areas, uh, nutrition, healthy development for children, ending poverty, all of those things. Um, Because nursing is a broad church with with a biopsychosocial approach to health. And the universal health coverage and the universal health access, back in 2015, nations around the world were all in agreement. This is important. So why is it important and what happens when we achieve universal health access and coverage? Universal health coverage is critical uh, because it means exactly what it says. It's health coverage for everybody everywhere. And we know already that there are uh, millions of people who won't ever see a health worker um, in their lives because of um, problems with distance, with uh, accessibility to somebody that will understand them, um, or with just being able to access any equipment or medicines that, that, that they might need, so problems of supply chain and so on. So universal health coverage, although it sounds actually quite um, bland in a way, because it's really meant to signify people not having a huge out-of-pocket expenses. It was built around the idea of um, health care that wasn't outrageously expensive for the poorest people. But in fact, it means health care for everybody everywhere. And if you just think about that, it's huge. Everybody, everywhere, not 80% of the population, but everybody. 
And that's a massive undertaking um, for our world today, overcoming some of the challenges and simply having health workers out there. Uh, But nevertheless, it's possible. And it's possible because we have such a technologically developed world that we can do this um, if we want to do it. And, And we have to have the will to do that. Well, it's interesting when I've looked at, there's so many different data points around why universal health coverage and access. And it dramatically lifts people out of poverty. I remember Melinda Gates at a couple of uh, presentations that she's given, she always asks people about how are we going to turn around poverty? And she asks, uh, what is the, the technology that has had the greatest impact on alleviating poverty? And you can see people kind of, you know, scratching their heads thinking, you know, they'll, they'll come up with something that um, is over in a different field, but she just always surprises people. She says it's family planning and making Uh sure that people have access to care, that it is uh, pregnancy intention. And it goes back Uh to if you want to lift a group of people out of poverty, people can't work, they can't get educated if they're not healthy. And so where there has been universal health coverage and access, that's where we've seen a dramatic shift in a population's overall growth, development, vitalization. But more nurses in the workforce on its own is not going to solve the problem. Um, and in fact, it's not even going to be a solution because you've got, if you train more nurses, you've got to have more teachers, you've got to have more clinical placements so they become competent. Then you've got to keep them in the workforce. So you've got to have salary and incentives to keep them and you've got to place them where they're needed and all of those issues are tied up with universal health coverage and that's why we don't have it um, in many many countries because we need the governance that can give the oversight to plan those services and often that's what we don't have you know a lot of the solutions are actually very You can say they're simple solutions, but they're actually very complex when you get right down to it. And I think it's that knowledge of complexity um, that helps me, I think, to see with other people in this campaign and on my team that we have to have a broad vision, a broad optic to look at how things are going to change and to target policymakers and politicians to also look at this broad optic with regard to nursing. We trip over evidence generated by nurses and have a lot of nurses who can champion that evidence. However, what we don't have are non-nurse champions who will listen to it and present it to government and to to the purse holders, to the policy makers. And that's, I think, that's the weak link So the Nursing Now campaign, can you give a history and an overview and the aims? Sure. So the campaign started um, in February 2018, and it was started really out of the interests of an all-party parliamentary group in England, which was chaired by Lord Nigel Crisp. And this group... um, examined the impact or the potential impact really and the challenges to nursing globally um, in achieving really health for all, uh, universal health coverage. Um, And what the group found in their report, which was called Triple Impact, was that while nursing had this potential triple impact on health, gender equity and economic development, it was often not realized because there was insufficient investment in nursing and that nurses were not allowed, often by either by law or by um, regulation in the countries they practiced it, to work to the top of their license, which means they were trained to do things which they were then not allowed to do. Um, and one, uh, you know, that, that was true actually wherever you looked at nursing. So even in the UK, for example, it took years and years for nurses, although they were taught how to do, how to prescribe, to get prescribing rights. Um, 
if you go to uh, places in uh, lower income countries, um, nurses often have very advanced practice and extended roles, but they have no policy to help them uh, practice in those ways. So the goal of our campaign is to improve health by raising the status and profile of nurses. All health needs will only be met in a team, but nurses can lead those teams. And so we're trying to develop leadership skills uh, across the board through our partners, ICN, WHO, other partners here, um, and develop young nurses, which we're doing through the Nightingale Challenge next year, which is a challenge to employers of nurses to put 20 young nurses through a leadership development program that will help them see how nursing should interact with policy and policy makers so that nurses are at the policy making um, decision or in the policy making decision making rooms, which they're currently not. And, you know, we believe nurses should be at every high level discussion, every talking heads program about health that's on the tally. Nurses should be in those programs. And currently they're not. They're almost invisible in many countries. So our quest is to raise the visibility of nurses so that um, they can contribute fully to improving global health. So the Nursing Now campaign, it is addressing the urgency because there is a uh, looming shortage that we are not going to get around just because of the aging demographics and the demand and need. There is raising the visibility of what nurses do, what they have done and what they can do. And it is putting nurses in policy and leadership roles at all levels such that the health and the health delivery and the health outcomes of populations can be dramatically improved. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. And we, do, we want leadership at all levels. Yes, we do. But we also do want to see leadership at the top levels too, and real leadership, not people put in positions with no budget uh, and no staff. Yeah. When people say nurses need a voice at the table, my response has been, we have a voice. What we don't have is a budget, influence, decision-making, and accountability. Yeah. And exactly. And those, yeah. those are the game changers. They're the game changers. Exactly they are. And we did a big survey um, last year, two and a half thousand nurses around the world um, with the support of Johnson & Johnson and IntraHealth International. And this is exactly what we found. Nurses said, you know, I could really be successful in a senior leadership role if I have budgetary discretion. And it's the old, old story that you put somebody in a leadership position because you have to, you know, because somebody says there's no women or there's no nurses. So you put them in the leadership position, but you don't give them a budget or an adequate budget and you don't give them any staff. So at the end of two years, you say, well, what have they done? Nothing. See, I told you. We didn't need one. And you very close to that report. Can you comment on that? What What was your takeaway? Actually, it was interesting, that report. I came away. I, I expected to see the gender issue um, really at the top of the reasons why nurses didn't feel they could progress in leadership. And it wasn't at the top. It was more these practical things like I need the equipment and I need the budget and, you know, I, I need an enabling environment to enable me to be a leader. However, having said that, um, there are really critically important gender issues, which, you know, we, you're right. It's very difficult to talk about them um, um, because it sounds like we've put on this old broken record, you know, oh, it's just because we're women, we can't get on. But if you look at the results of what our study and what people said, it's and, and also the results of other studies. I mean, it's not just our studies. Other studies will lend weight to this. There is this glass escalator, you know, that takes men to the top. And part of the reason for that is because women are seen as having family responsibilities. And in fact, they do have family responsibilities because other studies show that men do a lot less in the home. So what we're really talking about, you know, is a very big shift in the ways that women and men 
think about their roles and their responsibilities. And really, nursing should be represent, representative of the population. So it should be 50% men, 50% women, and all the other you know, diversities that are in populations. Um, but it never, ever has been because nursing is seen as women's work. And that is still very detrimental. And I've been reading quite a lot of Mary Beard recently about women and voice. And I realize that nurses are seen as as complaining, <laughs> whiny <laughs> women. You know, they're, they're not seen as making a point, which men would be seen doing. You know, if these were male doctors, they'd be listened to. They'd be on the radio have, making a point. But nurses are seen as whinging. Um, and I'm very struck that Mary Beard points this out time and again about women of voice, that when women make a complaint, it's seen as, you know, whinging and they need patting on the head. Yeah, I was having a conversation with a couple of nurse researchers about this, and they made the observation, nurses are very, very, very good about identifying problems. So they lead oh. with the problem, and that may be part of the perception of why there is a higher rate of complaining rather than uh, putting forward solutions. Um, the Well, the other part of that enablement and building workforce capacity is using technology to remove the geographic boundedness using something like an AI or a chatbot mm -hmm. or virtual care. Uh, there are so many new possibilities. And what that requires is a regulatory framework and a system that is designed to how we have progressed as civilizations and as science and as technology. And it sounds like at Nursing Now and this movement with all of these different clusters and hives of activity, nurses are really thinking about how to meet people and deliver the care where it's needed in new and different and I think really exciting ways. Mm. I think that's true, Shauna. And I think particularly among young nurses who they're the ones that really realize the potential of technology and the, you know, what having a platform of connectedness can do um, for you. But I think, you know, there are exciting developments in pockets in many places um, but they're not they're not being rolled out as rapidly as perhaps they could, I think. What is your thought about curriculum evolving? When we think about how we're preparing all of our health professions, what are some of the innovations that need to happen at the curriculum level so that the caring professions that we are training today are prepared for the situations we have yet to imagine? We have to be, as a profession, I feel, we have to be building our curricula in a way that allows the maximum flexibility. And we should be going for the guide by the side, not the sage on the stage model, which, you know, is always the nursing model. So it's a, I think it's a case of having many more demonstrations of how things can be different and how they look and how they work. You know, when I look back on my training, which was, you know, when Abraham was a lad, um, <laughs> it was a long, long time ago. The dinosaurs were walking the earth at that point. <laughs> they certainly were. We were putting bandages on their legs. Um, no, it was a long time ago. And, to, you know, that is a phrase I use sometimes in just talking about the world, really, then and now, is I could not have imagined what this world today would have looked like when I was training as a nurse. And, you know, yet that has a wonderful possibility because if you can only imagine it, it might actually come to happen, you know, come to be. And if I could really reform nursing curricula, I would put a politics module in it um, about, you know, the importance of politics and policy and economics. So I think nurses can be fantastic um, and the most, the strongest nurse champions are the ones, I think, who move outside nursing into either politics or some sort of other uh, arena, you know. 
So uh, in our, on our board, we have Baroness Mary Watkins of Tavistock, who was a mental health nurse, but was also vice chancellor of a university and is now in the House of Lords. And so she talks politically. And I think that's really important. To me, that's our weak link. Um, so you're in full support of my admonition when I tell nurses, start going to the technology and policy conferences. Go to the <laughs> forbidden places. Yes. Go to the places where you're new and novel and you're sharing an insight that people in housing or law enforcement or food systems uh, or data science are not familiar with. Absolutely. And, you know, the only people who do that is the people like prison nurses or forensic nurses um, who are with teams that are predominantly not nurses. So they really make their presence felt. But interestingly, those are the people who are largely silent in the nursing arena. So, you know, what we've tried to do is provide a platform to bring these diverse groups together so they can talk to each other. Nursing now is the first opportunity nurses have had to really create a social movement. And I think it's been possible because of social media. Um, and if you think about, you know, times when nurses have, not there have been many, but times when nurses' voices have been heard, it's tended to be small group or individuals. Um, but we've actually reached you know, the second stage of a social movement, we've kind of got organized and we've got communication between groups. So in my view, 2020 is going to be a once in a lifetime, certainly for me, opportunity um, for nurses to really look for a different future together. So I'm, you know, that's what drives me forward with this campaign, I think we can really make substantive change in 2020. Barbara Stilwell is the executive director of the Nursing Now Global Campaign. I am so excited to move nurses into the thick of these really important conversations and see how that really impacts the health of citizens, every aspect of their lives. I'm really excited to see how we're going to unleash the creativity of nurses, instigating and enabling and catalyzing all sorts of innovations, watching them take risks, make mistakes, sharing it all so that we can learn from it. I'm excited to see a new crop of storytellers. How are we going to create these new cultural touchstones and healthcare muses? I'm excited to hear the new stories that are going to be produced by other news sources because they have discovered this treasure trove of insights and talent. And I'm really excited to learn from our community, from our audience. What problems are they seeing and solving? And on one really grand global ambition with the sustainable development goals in mind surrounding health and well being, you know, the healthcare sector. It's an enormous pipeline of female talent. If we get this right for nurses, we'll have created the roadmap for every sector of our economy and made significant strides forward for societies around the globe. I'm excited, I'm humbled, and I am ready to proceed. I'm Shauna Butler, and this is See You Now. Thanks for listening. See You Now is created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Download and subscribe to See You Now wherever you get podcasts and leave us a review while you're there. It helps millions of people find the show. To learn more about Johnson & Johnson, the American Nurses Association, and the See You Now podcast, visit seeyounowpodcast.com. <laughs>